A PhD isn't just about developing your technical knowledge and gaining research experience. There are also a few important soft skills that can help you both during and after your PhD. And one of the most important, but most often overlooked soft skills is networking. So once you graduate and you start looking for jobs, your network, it's almost as important as your skills and your publication record. Because if you know people in your field, you're much more likely to hear about jobs and you're also at a huge advantage in your job applications if people already know you. It might not seem fair, but that's just how the world works. But it's not just about building a network for a future career. I strongly believe that to do the best research, you need to work with other people and that the whole idea of being an independent researcher is nonsense. And I also think that networking, or rather just being able to engage with other people, it just makes life better. So in this video, I'm going to share a few quick tips to help you start making these connections. But first, if we haven't met before, my name's James Hayton. I'm a recovering physicist, and for the last 12 years, I've worked full-time coaching PhD students in academic writing, in project management, and stress management skills. So if you'd like to know more about what I do, head to my website at phd.academy. So as with all skills, networking starts on a small scale with the things you do on a daily basis. So it starts with the smaller personal connections that you make with the people around you, rather than thinking in terms of building a professional network just to help your career. So the first aspect of networking that I'd like to talk about is your mindset. So a lot of PhD students I've worked with tend to make themselves kind of small and invisible, possibly because of imposter syndrome, where they don't want to draw attention to themselves for fear of being found out. Now, you might be able to avoid attention in the short term, but in the long term, this way of thinking and acting turns everything inwards and you end up in this tiny, stressful inner world. And the more time you spend there, the more you'll stress about what other people think and the more you'll worry about rejection. But ultimately, this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you end up isolating yourself. But if you do the opposite, and instead of making yourself small and invisible, you expand and let yourself be seen, it opens up possibilities to connect with others. So how do you do this? It's actually much simpler than you think. So if you work in a university department, there'll be people you see every day who you recognize, but you've never spoken to. So when you pass them in the corridor, just say hi. Or if you're in the queue for the coffee machine, start a conversation with the person next to you. Or if you're sitting in a lecture theater and someone you don't know sits next to you, say hello and introduce yourself. Or um, if you see someone new in the corridor who's clearly just started, again, you can just introduce yourself. Now, if you're a bit shy, this can be daunting. But the more you do this, the easier it gets. And I know this because... I used to be unbelievably shy and often had really quite severe social anxiety. But I realized that my introversion and my shyness were defense mechanisms. And as defense mechanisms, they were terrible because in the long term, they caused me a lot more distress. So I made a decision to open myself up and just start conversations with people. And what I found is that most other people walk around with a kind of protective shell around them. But if you make the first move, then they open up very quickly. 
they're generally happy that someone has noticed them. And from that point on, they'll say hello to you in the corridor. But if you don't work in a university department or if you find it difficult to start doing this at work, you can practice this anywhere. So when you go to a cafe, find out the barista's name. They'll appreciate it. And then every time you go there, you've got that existing connection. And this feels good and it helps to reinforce the habit. Now, of course, asking the name of a barista doesn't directly help you build your professional network, but it helps you build the habits and skills that will help you to do that later. And of course, it's just a nice thing to do. Now, the important thing here is that you're connecting with other humans purely for the sake of connection. It's not because you want something from them. If you only think of networking in terms of what you can personally gain, people will pick up on it and probably react defensively. So then, once you've started making those initial connections, the next level is just to be interested in the other person. So the common mistake here is to think, I'm not good enough, or I'm not interesting enough. But the way to be interesting to other people is to be interested in them. So if you're talking to another PhD student or academic, find out what they're working on. Or um, once you know them a little, ask them how they are or um, how their weekend was. Or you can do this another way and take a proactive interest and keep track of what others are doing in your department and what they're publishing. So read their papers and ask a question about the work. Or you can just say, hey, I saw you just got a paper published in whatever journal and congratulate them. If you show that you care about other people, they're more likely to care about you. Now, of course, not everyone will be open to conversation. There will be some academics who kind of see you as beneath them, or they might just be a bit socially awkward, or maybe they're just having a bad day. But if you do this kind of thing a lot, these individual negative reactions affect you a lot less because you're less dependent on that one interaction and you start to realize that it's not about you. So having started to develop these basic skills on a local, everyday level, how do we then apply them to build a broader network of professional connections? Conferences are great for this. I mean, it's why they exist. But not many people know how to make the best use of them. So what a lot of people will do is stick with their own little bubble of people they already know. Or they'll maybe target one person, perhaps some expert in their research area that they want to talk to, and then they ignore everyone else in between. Now, there's nothing wrong with checking the conference program and finding out who's speaking and then trying to have a conversation with that person. That's a good thing to do. But if you just target that one person, it puts a lot of pressure on that single interaction and you miss out on a lot of other potential connections. So if you see someone you don't know who isn't talking to anyone, or if you're next to somebody in a queue for coffee, just introduce yourself and again, be interested in what they do. And if you've practiced this in your everyday life, then it's easy to do in these different, slightly more daunting situations. And again, you should make these connections without looking for anything in return. And just talk to anyone and be interested in them and what they do. And this has a kind of snowball effect as some of the people you speak to introduce you to others. Or if you really want to make an impression, you can start making introductions too. And because most people will stick to their own bubble, it really doesn't take much to stand out. And once you've got those initial contacts, they might not immediately be useful to you, but months or even years later, they could lead to important conversations or collaborations or even career-defining opportunities. So next, I'd like to talk about cold emailing people you've had no prior contact with. 
The same basic principles apply. You generally don't want to email people you don't know just to ask them for something. They're busy and they probably have a thousand other emails to get through. So your chances of getting a reply are probably quite low. But remember, the way to be interesting to other people is to be interested in them and their work. So if you've read a paper that's interesting and relevant, you can email the author and ask a question about it. Or if you went to a conference and you saw a great talk, but you didn't get to speak to them, send them an email afterwards complimenting them on the talk and again, asking a question. Be interested in what they do. Maybe you'll never hear back from them, but that's okay. At least you tried. But maybe it will lead to a conversation. And then later, when you're looking for jobs, you've got that pre-established relationship. I also think this approach is a great way to get into a PhD program if you're at that stage. Basically, by establishing relationships with academics who've, whose work you're interested in long before you actually apply. This takes work and patience, but this will put you far ahead of pretty much any other candidate because despite how many people I say this to, and despite how many people will watch this video, nobody else is going to do it. Now, I know that some of you will be watching this video and thinking, yeah, but I'm doing a remote PhD, so I can't do these things. And yes, it's tough. Everything is way more difficult when you're isolated and when you don't have regular contact with other researchers. But this just makes it more important to make extra effort to make those connections. And I'd say to start with the same basics I mentioned earlier, saying hello to your neighbors and asking the name of the barista in the cafe. Then you can start to think about how to make connections with other students and researchers. And I'll leave it up to you to come up with ideas and ways to do this because there are always solutions if you think creatively about the problem. So try some of these things and let me know how it goes. They can seem difficult at first, but they do get easier and the benefits can be life-changing. So as always, if you like this video, please hit like and subscribe as it helps other people to find it. But also head to my website at phd.academy and sign up for email updates so I can let you know when I publish new videos because YouTube won't always show you the latest videos even if you're subscribed. You'll also find details on my website of my online writing course and my book, as well as the one-to-one -one coaching I do and details of live training at universities. So that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching to the end and I'll see you next time.